everyone. I'm going to reconvene our um, Board of Supervisors meeting for Monday, May 1st. Can you hear? You can't hear me. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, reconvening the meeting, and um, we are going to go straight into. We didn't have a closed meeting, so we're going straight into the public hearings. Yes, ma'am. Um, what's up here? Uh, you have uh, two public hearings, or three public hearings on your schedule tonight. The first two um, uh, will deal with matters that aren't concerning the Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission will then convene, and then you'll have a public hearing that's joint with the Planning Commission. So, Commissioners, sit tight. We'll get there. Uh, so the first public hearing tonight is uh, regarding the uh, secondary six-year plan. Uh, it's a jointly held between the county and VDOT. Uh, the VDOT representatives are here today if you have any questions for them or the um, on the decisions that need to be made. Uh, but each year, uh, the Board of Supervisors holds a public hearing related to this six-year six plan, often called the SSYP, um, and it's in conformance to Code of Virginia Section 33-2331. Um, the Board is empowered to um, identify how certain funds are allocated through the county and which projects they are allocated to, and most of that funding is restricted for use on unpaved roads. Uh, we have some unpaved roads in this community, and um, each year you go through the process of reviewing those roads that are unpaved and eligible to be hard surfaced with unpaved road funds. Generally, that means they need to have 50 vehicles per day uh, traveling on them and meet certain geometric requirements. Um, the, uh, several years ago, the state amended uh, code to allow what is now referred to as a rural rustic program that reduced the standards necessary to pave these secondary roads uh, to something closer to a pave in place as opposed to fully reconstructing those secondary roads to meet current secondary road standards. Uh, back in the day when that was in place, it was extremely expensive to hard service any of these uh, unpaved roads, and now it's much more cost effective to do that. Last year, uh, when you went through this uh, process for your six year plan, uh, the board adopted a plan that included um, hard surfacing two sections of Kaiser Run Road, one section of Horton Hollow Road, the, uh, extending the hard surface from the Lizzie Mills side, uh, hard surfacing Pullins Bluff Road from end to end, and then hard surfacing Turkey Ridge Road from where it uh, uh, starts at the Culpeper Line uh, near O'Bannon's Mill Road and extends 0.8 miles. Uh, at your last meeting, the Board of Supervisors authorized me to uh, place a public hearing notice in the newspaper and place road uh, signs to alert the public that you're considering adding uh, several segments, one of several segments, to this six-year plan. Now that that six-year plan is advanced a year, the last year of that plan is, is funded but doesn't have any uh, allocation or doesn't have a, a road assigned to it. So the road segments that uh, the Board asked me to advertise are Mill Hill Road, which was broken in two pieces by VDOT to get to reasonable size, uh, 0.9 miles from the um, start at Riley Hollow, and then the last 0.9 miles to the end of state maintenance. Also, the board asked for Sycamore Ridge Road, uh, the entire length to be included in the public hearing advertisement. And then lastly, Turkey Ridge Road, ending from where the first segment, uh, or starting where the first segment ends, um, and then ending at the single lane bridge at the sharp corner. Those are the roads that are available to the Board of Supervisors to add to the secondary plan. Um, if you wanted to add any others, uh, we'd have to go through the public hearing process again because they weren't uh, referenced in that public hearing notice. Um, I think that's a good rundown. Um, you must hear from the public, see what they want to say. I did place in front of your uh, spots a list of uh, feedback that we received in the office for people that uh, called in in response to the signs. And uh, you can see that information as you make your determinations and then add to that what you hear from the public today. Happy to answer any questions as is Vita. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing for this 
agenda item only. So if you have any um, comments with regards to the secondary six-year plan, please be recognized, raise your hand, be recognized, and come up to the mic, give us your name and the district you're in, you live in. Mike. Uh, I'm uh, Mike Atkins. I live on Sycamore Ridge Road. I've lived there about 15 years. Lived in Rappahannock forever. <laughs> but uh, the road really would be great for heart service. And for me personally, I've talked to a lot of people on it. Uh, the corner where it joins the park road, when it gets wet, it's always muddy. And I mean, nasty muddy. Otherwise, it's a dust storm every time you come through. I, and it really doesn't matter. People don't cope very much. But when you go through every day, it's kind of a hassle. In the wintertime, this year wasn't bad. Of course, it wasn't wet. But wet, when it's wet, it's like going need a four-wheel drive just about to get through. And, I just, and I've talked to a lot of my neighbors, not all of them, but a lot of them, and they're for it. And uh, you know, we hope you consider it. It would make it much better, nice, nicer for us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mike. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm Carol Taylor. I live on Sycamore Ridge Road. Um, I know that y'all are going to be working on the bridge that has to be repaired. It just kind of makes sense to just go on up that sharp, steep hill where the bus school bus goes every day, twice a day, and it's like a washboard. I don't see how they do it, to be honest. Um, and the dust rolls. I don't. The people that live right on the side of the road, I don't see how they stand it because it just rolls all over their houses. I mean, one person has a pool, and I'm sure it's just filthy because the dust just rolls because it's so dry. And it gets scraped when it gets bad enough that they'll come and do it, which they do a great job, but it would be so much less work, I would think, if it was paved for the county expense-wise. Um, I just think it would be a great project. And it's, you know, it's not a trail. People treat it like it's a trail, but it is a state road. So I would like it to look like a state road so that maybe they would respect people that are on it and most of them don't get out of the road. You know, you have to wait till they feel like they're gonna move on. So it'd be nice to make it actually look like a real road. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Kay. Yes, sir. Tom Taylor, Piedmont District. Um, I would like to see it improved. Uh, as a boy riding the bus with our siblings, that was a highlight of our day was going down that hill twice a, twice a day, <laughs> getting home. It was like going to King's Dominion for a roller coaster ride. <laughs> it was really, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's the family farm has an entrance off of this road beside my sister's place and the other folks. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it is tough to pass through sometimes, it's narrow, but it would certainly be improved if we could cut down on the dust. At least you could see somebody coming at you. Uh, you know, they, it'd be, the air would be clear. So uh, well, I hope you'll consider, uh, you know, putting this through and giving us uh, some tar and chip or pavement or whatever we can get. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm Dan Mulcahy. I live on Mill Hill Road. And uh, for pretty much the same reasons that all these people talked about their road, I'd like to see Mill Hill uh, improve somewhat hard surface of some type. Uh, and I believe this for the same reasons of mud, dust, washboard, washing out. And it's been that way. It's a pretty bad road, narrow in a lot of places. And I think it'd be a lot of improvement for our vehicles if we could get some type of hard surface on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Bill Taylor, Piedmont District. Uh, obviously, I'm their sibling, um, so I'm part of the family farm there. But I bought two tracks of timber for our Augusta Lumber Company at Amosville, where I work, on that road in 2023 pretty big struggle for the log trucks to get up the washboard hill, tight turns. Uh, so from a business side of it, I'd like to see it. Uh, I got quite a few complaints from my loggers of the danger and the um, 
chattering of their axles trying to get up that hill. Um, so I'd like to see it improved for their reasons and for business reasons too in the future. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I do see that we have one person on Zoom. The only public comment we're to, or the public hearing is only for the six year plan, but if you have something to say, please raise your Zoom hand. Okay, no Zoom hand. All right, at this time, I will close the public hearing and open it up to the board. Um, and we have obviously VDOT here in numbers. Should we have questions? Um, Mr. Curry, I, I certainly should know this by now, but <laughs> every year we uh, go through the same process and I have questions. Um, so the priority list adopted last year, we have Kaiser Run Road, Wharton Hollow, Poland's Bluff, Turkey Ridge. Am I correct that our any action taken today would be to add certain other roads to that uh, ongoing yeah. list? Well, and you could technically remove roads from that list. Um, I know VDOT's working on the, the nearest ones because funding's already allocated to those projects. Design is happening. Uh, the first one, for example, all the grading is done. It just uh, may have been chip sealed already this year, and there's probably just a little bit of work left. And then the second section, it will be not too far after it, after we get enough money. So um, we would recommend that you not pull roads off the list because it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to share with the public why, why the board put it on and take it off, although you've done it before. Um, and, uh, and the goal of the, the uh, public hearing notices with great detail and with the roadside step-in signs is to make sure the citizens understand what's happening and then have an opportunity to speak uh, so that you have a fully informed decision before you ever add a, a road to that list. I mean, <clears throat> in terms of the priority list, um, I believe you were just referring to Kaiser Run Road 614, is that correct? Yeah, the first uh, 3.29 miles, that is nearly done. Okay. And then you said the second section, maybe it's more for VDOT, the second section will be addressed next, and that's our, that work is already underway. But the design work is underway, I believe. Okay, and then if we go down this list established last year, the next is Horton Hollow Road. Is that has that been touched yet, or no? And so one of the things you can do, um, uh, if you pull up the draft plan, um, and I don't know how well this will show, but um, the way this works, and it's very small. I'm sorry is each one of these rows is one of these different projects, and so they're in order. And the funding becomes available, and as you work your way out into 23, fiscal 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, that money cascades down as yep. it becomes available. So you add another 300 or so thousand or whatever it is every year, and so you, as you move into out years, the funding becomes available. So for, for Horton Hollow, uh, money is uh, shown that it still needs three hundred thousand dollars to be done. It will receive forty thousand in the upcoming fiscal year, and then remainder of its funding will come in fiscal year twenty-five. Okay. Uh, so they wouldn't start that until they have money for that project. Okay. And I, I, I don't want to step on the toes of my colleagues um, because none of these roads, as it turns out, are in the voting district I represent. But from a process standpoint, to the extent that we have what what seems like more a sense of urgency with her and certainly um, sort of unified support for paving, for example, on Sycamore Ridge Road. I just hope we can all think together the extent to which we might want to put Sycamore Ridge onto the priority list in, a, in, in perhaps a midpoint position as opposed to tacking it onto the end. Um, just a thought. Yeah. <clears throat> I sometimes sarcastically call this the 18-year road plan, mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, I don't mean that in any way a slight, but at you, <laughs> but more at Richmond. But anyway, uh, if we were to, the only way that you can put this anywhere else would be to bump 
projects that are already on there. Right, and I would uh, say that uh, Sycamore Ridge was considered in past years um, and was passed over, for lack of a better word, for these other roads. Well, the outcry the last year was really for Turkey Ridge. Right. Um, there really was an outcry for Turkey Ridge to be added last year. So, um, and I, I have to say, when I when I revisit this list, I remember the reasons in particular why we picked Kaiser Run Road, because it runs up to the Little Devil Staircase. It gets a lot of usage. <clears throat> and even though it's in Piedmont District, people from all over use that road. And it has a lot more traffic than you would think a little right. back road would have. Um, so that was one of the reasons why we, I think, all agreed that Kaiser Run Road was a good addition um, to this list. And uh, Poulin's Bluff Road is rough. Sycamore Ridge is also rough and needs a lot of care. Uh, I have to admit I haven't been up there for a little while. But uh, it, if it's as bad as Kaiser Run was, it probably needs a lot of work. And I can speak to Mill Hill. Um, didn't realize that it was going to cost that much money for two sections, um, which means it could take a while. Um, but it is, it, I, I've been on Sycamore and I've been on Mill Hill, and they're probably very similar. Um, the problem that I have, I'm not sure how clear it is to the public, public because it wasn't totally clear to me what it would mean to take on a back road such as Mill Hill to make it fit what VDOT requires. Um, and I would appreciate it if the board doesn't mind if you would speak to what it would take to take like a Mill Hill road um, and, and make it fit your VDOT requirements um, as far as what the citizens would go from today versus at the end game. Because I'm not sure it's as clear to them as because I'm as confused as they are, I guess. Sure. Um, the uh, I'm Mark Nesbitt. I'm the resident engineer for uh, the dot uh, working residency, and uh, appreciate uh, being here. And uh, the rural rustic program, like you said, was initiated several several years ago. I don't remember the exact year, but one of the reasons was to to try to um, to, to enable you know, VDOT to, to uh, hard surface more gravel roads in a more expedited fashion and, and, and a more economic cost. And um, the, the program itself, it, it is available, it's online, I can get you the, you know, and I think some of you are, are, have probably looked at it before, but yeah, it's, you, get, you look at a lot of stuff. The, the main thing is to try, most of the, all these roads have a 30 foot prescriptive easement, which means we don't own it. Uh, the property owners own the road up to the center point, center line of the road. So we don't own it, but by law, because it's a state road, we are we have the authority to maintain it, to do what we need to do within that 30-foot prescriptive easement to maintain that road. And the Rural Rustic um, Program uh, allows us to go and make certain improvements to that uh, to the roadway, and, and it, it does recommend like an 18-foot wide pavement which is what we try to get, it's a, um, it's a pavement that allows two vehicles to pass. Uh, now, depending on the, the road, some roads are, have, are narrower, and we have to, we go and we, we have to try to reclaim some of that road or establish the road uh, a little bit wider. We pull from the banks. We, you know, we, we get our motor graders out there and, and make some minor improvements to try to get that extra width to get it to where we can get two cars to pass. Uh, and plus the uh, the, uh, the statutory uh, speed limit for uh, rural rustic roads, uh, hard surface and un un unpaved, are uh, is 35 miles an hour. So some of these roads, you imagine, I know you drive every day. You imagine going 35 on a paved road, it might you know, it, it's it's probably going to be pretty difficult. Um, so what what I'm just saying is to be able to get some of these roads wide enough. To, uh, for two cars to pass, it's going to change the character of the road. We have to do some tree removal, selected tree removal. We have to uh, do some sloping. Sometimes we have to get permission to get off of the easement to, 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 to get to correct uh, enough slope so we can uh, get the road wide enough. Uh, we typically bring in enough stone. We raise the road about six inches in grade to get a good base, and then we replace all the stone. Uh, 
I believe we replace almost all the storm drain pipes that are crossing the road to make sure that we have a good you know, pipe that's going to last. Because most of the pipes that are in there were installed many years ago. They're corrugated uh, metal and they're, a lot of them are rusted out. So we go and replace all those. And we do replace a lot of the driveway pipes because the, we want to get the, the drainage, the sideline drainage as, as good as we can. Uh, it's not going to be perfect because uh, you know, we are grading a, a, an existing gravel road that's been uh, in place for years and years. Um, and so we, but we, we try to get a ditch uh, where we can. We try to get a, you know, a, a good positive drainage. Uh, we, uh, we don't have to get any environmental permits other than uh, we do if we're crossing a, a live stream. We have to get a, a permit for that if we're crossing a live stream, but we can get general permits just for the typical pipe replacement, which we can do in-house. If we're crossing like at Sycamore, Ridge at that road. Uh, we are working on it, that pipe, that, that free pipe crossing. We are working on that. Uh, we've submitted all the information in to get a permit uh, uh, to, to replace those three pipes. So that's in the works, and hopefully we'll get that, what, in August, maybe. And our goal is to work on that project later on this year before the winter. Uh, but uh, we've ordered the pipe. We've got everything ready to go. We're just waiting on the permit. But. Uh, so uh, the, the goal is to get them with uh, as least of environmental impact as possible. Uh, but it will change the look of the road. And uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, VDOT staff did, um, after looking at Mill Hill <coughs> recently uh, and providing an updated um, estimate, said that there are some narrow areas on that road mm -hmm. that will require additional analysis um, and I had recommended to the board that uh, if uh, if you're of a mind to place that road on the list, I would suggest that um, you actually pick none of the above, add no roads to the list, and provide uh, VDOT, you know, the next year to go and really analyze this, the road to determine what can and can't be done. Um, this, the road on the sixth year out is not going to receive any work for a few years. Right. Uh, and so rather than putting a road on and taking it off, um, I would recommend you not put any road, which you are also allowed to do, and just leave that money unallocated at the end of the plan. <coughs> but but if, if Mill Hill is the area still requiring analysis from the VDOT side, why would that then lead to a decision to not add any roads, if I heard you correctly? Uh, because you you can't be if so if there my point is if there's a hue and cry uh, from the public and perhaps the board to add that road, okay. I would recommend you not add any road and allow the analysis to be conducted rather than add it and potentially have to take it off. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if there's a hue and cry for a different section, <clears throat> then I don't have a reservation and I don't think VDOT has a reservation on the geometry of those other roads. Is there an option to add another road and and still ask for analysis of Mill Hill? Yes. That's thank you. That, that was a question I was trying to ask. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess cut to the chase. And in, in my mind, Sycamore Ridge is a vital road. It yeah. it provides a loop um, in the hollow to a couple of other roads, off which a surprising number of people live. And sometimes a tree comes down, or there's flooding, and you have to figure out a different way around for any number of reasons. And and the incline on that road does make it very challenging, I think, to retain gravel and keep it a high quality road. Plus with the bridge work that's scheduled to happen soon, um, I think it would be really nice to have the road improvements along with the bridge improvements. So I would make a motion that we adopt um, the resolution by the Board of Supervisors of Rappahannock County, Virginia, adopting the secondary six year plan, SSYP for fiscal years 2024 2029 and fiscal year 2024 construction priority list slash budget uh, with the addition of Sycamore Ridge Road in the number six spot and taking into consideration the Mill Hill project for additional analysis and consideration next year. I'll second. We have a motion and a second discussion. Everybody repeat that. <clears throat> no. <laughs> um. I guess uh, my only point for discussion, I don't want to be, beat a dead horse here, but um, it seems, and Mark, if I missed something in your comments, that um, 
makes this more clear, I apologize and feel free to correct me. So what I understand so far is that Kaiser Run Road, that work is underway, but then what's remaining on the list are three, four, in the th third, fourth, and fifth positions. Um, no work has been undertaken in, with those roads, including Poland's Bluff. And given that the Sycamore Ridge Road project um, encompasses the entirety of that road at six tenths of a mile, and the cost is the least among all of those that we are considering adding this year. I just, I just wonder if Sycamore Ridge could not be elevated beyond the number six position. I don't think that's advantageous. We could revisit it next year, but the, the problem with doing that is that people have turned out in years past in support of these other roads. Fair enough. Yeah. And they may not understand that their position on the list is in question when we put another road on. The only time we've ever removed a road or jockeyed roads around on the listing was when we had a gallery full of people saying, please take my road off the list. Yeah. So unless there's really a large outcry of, of folks saying uh, make changes or pump the brakes, I'm hesitant to do it um, Okay. based on one night's attendance. Yeah, a point well taken. I was just looking at the, the length of it and the relatively low cost compared to the others. And I didn't know if that um, might inform some adjustment to the list. So, no, uh, I got it. Thank you. Poland's Bluff is awfully rough, too. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that's, I mean, that's the challenge. I do know the citizens of Mill Hill Road. Uh, this is the second year I think we have heard from them. Um, but I do believe and agree that an analysis um, that we can make sure that the citizens that are interested actually get some sort of, I don't know if it's in person, that would be great, um, communication and explanation of what it's going to take before we put money towards something and then they find out they really didn't want it. <coughs> um, what I'm understanding is the road's not in great condition and it sounds like you've been out not too long ago. Um, so I don't know what you found, but it seems like there's some work that could be done to it as is while we wait for the analysis and yeah, we can certainly uh, make sure that we're maintaining it as often as we can. Um, but I, I would like to have some time to do a more thorough review of the road. To, I, I don't want to commit to to uh, to fixing the road with, when there's maybe some impacts that the local residents may not like that that would cause. Okay. Yeah. I'm happy to work with you on the communication with the citizens. Okay. Right. Any other discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Honorable resolution. Oh, resolution. Sorry. Mr. Frazier? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. And I also. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Great information. Ordinance amendment to chapter 151. Okay. Uh, your next public hearing tonight is related to an ordinance amendment to chapter 151, taxation of the county code. Virginia Code section 152286 uh, enables the Board of Supervisors to include in your local code uh, provisions to um, withhold certain permits if taxes are not paid. Uh, the board has uh, adopted some of those provisions within the zoning ordinance uh, many years ago, uh, but not all of the provisions. And there, um, you're enabled to restrict issuance of building permits and land disturbance permits in addition to those zoning permits. Uh, and right now you do not restrict uh, the issuance of building permits and erosion sediment control permits. Uh, so what this ordinance amendment does is it adds to your taxation chapter um, a single paragraph that was advertised in the local newspaper as required by uh, the code. And uh, it, that, uh, well, that's not what I want to pull up. And that new paragraph 
uh, is in the violations and penalties section, and it uh, very closely parallels the language that is in the enabling state legislation in 15.2.2286, and, and enabling you to withhold issuing of permits if the treasurer is not, uh, up, if you're not up to date on your taxes with the treasurer. Uh, so the board asked me to advertise this for public hearing. It has been advertised as appropriate. It's not in your zoning ordinance, so therefore it does not require uh, the route through the uh, planning commission. Um, and it's here in chapter 151. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And after you hear from the public, you can consider adoption. All right, with that, I will open the public hearing with regards to ordinance amendment to chapter <coughs> 151. Anyone wishing to speak, please be recognized and come up and give us your name and your district. I don't think they understand that they have to say something. They have <laughs> to. reiterate um, if you are not current on your taxes and you seek a building permit <coughs> we can choose not to issue that building permit until you are current on your taxes there's enough there, there's enough uh, me, there's this enough. is a public hearing so if you want to come up to the mic and speak <coughs> give us your name and your district please my name is Clyde Scott. I live on Mill Hill Road. And I unfortunately, had a medical appointment and I didn't get, get here in time to speak about Mill Hill Road. But I'll say something first about Mill Hill Road. Stop the analysis and fix the Durnan Road. Mr. Mr. Scott, thank so you. So we're now this is the taxes. Yes, sir. The public <coughs> out here has got a monster on their back. And you don't need to put any more monster on that. I pay my taxes the first day I get my tax bill. I'm right over here paying those taxes. And that's, I've been there 35 years, and I ain't missed a thing. And these people right now that are out there suffering, they can't pay their taxes. So you're going to tell them they can't do something else? Because they don't pay it, it's that same type of stuff that's coming out of Washington, D.C. Well, it, well it's a, a next thing you know, if we criticize somebody, we're going to be paying more taxes. And you got to stop that. If somebody can't pay their taxes, there's a process. There's a process. You give them proper notification at a certain length of time. You sell a property if you have to. That's done all over Virginia. And this crap of, uh, of, uh, of, jur of legislators sticking all these other things on is a bunch of stuff. Now, I'm sure everybody here pays their taxes just like I do. And you don't have to go out here and mess with some poor person because they can't pay their taxes. They've got to do other things. What you've got to do is stop their water cut off their electric. So I'm not in, I'm not in favor of that type of solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not in favor, I'm not in favor of studying the road to death. If you go back on the history, I talked to you, Thank you sir. the day you were elected. Yes, I told you yes, about I told you that there was a road over there, a collector road. I've got I've got a deal for two Michelin tires. Because I couldn't pass a truck. I couldn't pass a school bus. Mr. Scott, Chewed not, up the backside of it. Not to be rude, I apologize. And that thing is exact road, exactly like it was the day before. Yes, the day I talked to you. Yes, sir. And it got chunks of asphalt falls out. Please. I'll tell you what, state went back on the end of this. this Mr. Scott, I'd be happy to meet with you on your road, but right I now. I met with you. You didn't do a thing. Excuse me. We are on the public hearing ordinance amendment to chapter 151 taxation. Well, I'm sorry. I can't take any. I'm hearings. sorry, I didn't get my say on the other one. Thank you. But there's a road over there that was supposed to be fixed, and you didn't fix it. They didn't fix it. They passed it up. As a matter of fact, it was a safety 
It was a safety project for some guy who got drowned. And I told Please you that. Take a seat. I'm going to take a seat. I'll trade places with you. Can I make a comment? Yes, sir. So, in, in reference to what y'all are talking about right now, uh, I think this is something that the uh, county treasurer has requested. It makes it's common sense that it's a good idea to, to do this. Uh, it's not only building permits, it's also special use permits, is that correct? The uh, special use permits have already been included in the zoning. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, well, uh, I would say that if the Treasurer of the county is in favor of this. It's probably a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What's his name in the voting district? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else wish you would speak? All right. Did I go to the visitor? I think I did. Okay. Um, at this time, I'll close the public hearing and open it up to the board. Um, just one one question. So, the Code of Virginia basically allows for localities to take this extra step as a protective measure against bad tax debt. Is that correct? Correct. And why today? Do you know our local legislative history? Why we have not done this? I, I can't speak to that necessarily, other than to say that within the zoning ordinance, it incorporated the portions that are related to zoning. Right. And it would not have been appropriate to incorporate the sections that aren't related to zoning in the zoning ordinance. And, you know, they probably took care of that at that time. I don't know if this state code section has been modified since then to add building permits and road right. control permits. I haven't done that research. Okay. Mm. Well, I would like to thank Ms. Nick, the treasurer, to uh, bringing it to our attention. And uh, I think that it is uh, a good idea and anything that would help treasurer to do her job, who does a fantastic job I'm in favor for, so I will uh, then uh, make a motion to adopt the uh, provided ordinance amendment as presented. I'll second. We have a motion and a second discussion. <clears throat> Actually, I don't see how it would help her do her job because it has nothing to do with um, how she would apply the, uh, the tax collection. It's, it's all about issuing the permits. So it just might encourage people to get level. I don't think anybody with 10% interest, I mean, you'd be better off using a credit card to pay your taxes than paying a 10% interest. So anybody that doesn't pay their taxes on time um, really can't. And the gentleman's right. It's just another impediment. Uh, I'm sorry, it's just another impediment that we're putting on the people. That are already possibly hurting financially. And I, I don't know, I went along with ha advertising this, but, um, and, and I'm surprised that we don't have much opposition to it, but it's, it's really, I don't think, necessary because it doesn't, if anything, I mean, if we issue permits and these people haven't paid their taxes, they probably would be worth more money, it might be easier to sell collector taxes. So it might be beneficial to go ahead and do it. But if somebody's got an impediment of you know, paying their taxes two or three thousand uh, dollars before they can put up a, an addition on their house, I, I don't think it's really a, a good idea. Well, regarding the gentleman's previous point, you know, I was fully in favor of the tax relief program that we were able to expand through with Ms. Graham's help. Um, and so I agree there fully that if there are folks that need help. Um, I think everybody qualifies. Oh, I understand. And I think that it's hard to capture everybody. I think that is difficult. And the more people that you give tax credit to, or, or uh, tax, uh, there's two, two sides of that. You've got tax credit, but you also have the tax uh, deferment. That's more money you have to collect from the people that are paying the taxes. Because we need X number of dollars to keep the lights on. So if we're deferring people, or granting relief, then we've got to take it from somewhere else. And, you know, sooner or later, if there's a tax bill that adds up, uh, I can see maybe not giving somebody a special use permit if they owe back taxes, but, uh, you know, doesn't permit. I don't think it's going to be. 
I can just see a situation where uh, it really doesn't work and it's unfair. So I, I see I see how this could be useful, especially someone who just doesn't maybe an absentee landowner who just doesn't really want to and decides to build. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to. And Miss Nick came to us and said, "Hey, I think this could be useful." And, um, which I support because I agree. I think that you're right. When you give tax relief to one group, it means you have to make up that that money somewhere else. But I, I, I consider that, that group that we're giving that tax relief to it, to be a need in the community. But your scenario that you just mm -hmm. mentioned, I mean, if somebody says, I'm just going to go ahead and build, or either build it with a permit or without one, if you're building without a permit, it's a violation. There's only so much we can do. If they build with a permit and they're not paying their taxes, then yeah. like I say, yeah. when it goes through the process for tax collection, the property is actually worth more money. It might actually sell and the town is protected. The property is worth more money. So you know, maybe you actually see yourself in the foot. My only comment is I think this neck has done an excellent job. And I don't know that she's brought us anything in the past that kind of been well thought out in terms of reason for doing it. Um, although you may be right, Mr. Frazier, there could be instances where it is a kind of a double negative. Um, I just I believe in supporting Treasurer and going something that's going to help. Yeah, I'm not saying that she's down. making a, ba a, a bad suggestion. I'm just saying that uh, just because she makes a suggestion doesn't mean we have to follow it. Uh, uh, similar discussion with Mr. Golf earlier, just because the county attorney gives us an opinion doesn't mean that we have to follow that either. Look how much trouble that got us into a couple times in the past. You know, they, there's a difference between what's legal and what's practical or the political ramifications of that opinion. And this is, this is an opinion from the treasurer, but there's also political and, and real consequences that are, you know, that are, are they, that, that maybe she didn't take into consideration. The, the last, We're supposed to, that's our job. Yeah, the last statement of this uh, new section um, states, unless otherwise authorized by the treasurer. And so it does give her the teeth to mandate that tax be paid. However, there is a situation of hardship. She is empowered to uh, manage, to understand that, determine the facts of the situation, and then and waive this requirement if she said so, not if the building official or somebody else says so, if the treasurer says so. Yeah. Who's responsible to the citizens? How does that not set up a situation of, of potential arbitrary increases? Uh, through elections. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if the citizens don't think that she's applying it appropriately, then I imagine they would have the opportunity to put somebody else in. Just as any other elected official would have we that same created, duty. We created the authority to do so. The, the ordinance is, is full of subjective matters that are, are um, determined by elected leaders. And uh, that's certainly a challenge, but that's why uh, you and they have stepped forward to be the arbiter of those subjective matters. It's a matter of policy, and I think this is pretty good policy. And I, that's just my opinion on it. And I, I really, uh, to echo Mr. Carney's accolades for the treasurer. Uh, the treasurer and our staff have done a really good job in whittling down our bad debt, bad tax-related debt to not a whole lot, but as we saw the other day and mentioned in our earlier session, there were some properties that went up for auction. And I think that if there are if there are tools that with which the treasurer can work to compel um, delinquent taxpayers to um, get straight with the county, so to speak, and then hopefully, <coughs> just looking at it optimistically, we don't end up in a, a situation where properties end up for auction. So to me, it's an interim uh, tool that can be exercised. And as Mr. Curry pointed out, the treasurer is the constitutional officer elected for this purpose, ultimately holds the discretion to determine if a hardship case might might require an exception or a waiver. So I think it's um, it's a balanced approach and I think it fills all remaining gaps in what we have available to us to get people to pay their taxes. I don't know how often
often it would be used, but I, I do think it's reasonable to ask people to uphold their tax obligations before they take an additional building or applying for permits. I think that's entirely reasonable. And at the end of the day, you know, we all we all incur a tax obligation, and uh, if we don't pay it, that's sort of saying that we're exempt somehow. That doesn't apply to us, and that's just a, that's not fair to everybody else. And I, I do know that folks in our offices, the folks in the county offices here around Hennick, work really hard to try to work with people that can't afford to pay their taxes, and um, in terms of helping to broaden the exemptions for people that, that might have financial hardships and, and not be able to pay their taxes. We work very hard to, to make that more inclusive and expand that. And I, I think it's reasonable to say that when you apply for a building permit, if you owe that taxes, that, that we're asking you to make that a priority. Thank you for the discussion. This is another roll call vote. Uh, I just have to say that at no time did I at no time did I mention that I thought that our constitutional officers were not doing their job. Yes, but that's what I heard that they were all doing great jobs and uh, really that doesn't have anything to do with it. the question. Well, the, okay. the question is whether we put another impediment in front of the people that may already have one. Uh, and so that use table is full of 
uh, P's, SP's, and SE's to designate how each would be permitted. Uh, this public hearing um, and the ordinance amendment, which is provided with the attached documents and has been available either online or in my office for review from the public uh, during the two week uh, notice period, uh, changes all of the SP's in the use table to SE's. Uh, uh, identifying that those uses that would have been or are currently permitted by special use permit will in the future be permitted by special exception. Uh, there are also instances throughout the rest of the document where additional cleanup was required. For example, uh, a further section might require some special requirements uh, in order to obtain your special use permit. Uh, and those sections had to be modified so that it's no longer said special use permit, it's said special exception. And that's really the core of what was uh, adjusted. There are a couple of uh, typos that are correct along the way as well. Uh, happy to answer any questions to the board if you have any or the planning commission. And uh, if there aren't any further questions, you can open the public, the joint public hearing and see what the public has to say. Do any of the members of the planning commission have any questions? And I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And um, it is for the ordinance one or the chapter one seven zoning of the county code review. Anyone wishing to speak, please be recognized and go to Mike, give us your name and your district. <laughs> Jennifer Alexander, Wakefield District. The that man there in the painting was my neighbor for a long time. He was in the home as was Carol. And I'm here because we had some incidences on my driveway, which had to do with special permit exceptions. And people not really adhering to what they agreed to in their, within their exceptions, permits. Um, so I propose, one, that you add some sort of language in here that says family events really shouldn't be any sort of permitting. If you're going to have a wedding and you've got a large family, I really don't see that we need to have those people come in and get permission. Nor some of the local organizations, they're, they're all people that live here, they know each other, they know what they're doing, and they're pretty careful. For instance, the fox hunts. They all know how to behave, they know each other, and they know what's in their best interest to behave. However, events that are advertised on the internet are an issue. And this comes under two things. One, how many people should be permitted to come of uh, a shared driveway, mine in particular, to a permitted event? Two weeks ago, one week ago, the historic garden league. I had 819 people on my driveway. That's over 400 cars on the driveway meant for one going each way. There was an accident. This is not the first accident related to events going up to my neighbor. It's not the second accident on our driveway. It's not the third accident on our driveway. I think it's a little past time to do something about some of these things that have been proposed about the width of the driveway, the number of people. Um, I think also, I have it written out, but let me skip it. Um, it needs to be in writing so that the people who come in for their special permit know exactly what they can and can't do. So they can't then turn around and say, oh, I didn't know, which is a problem. And there also needs to be some sort of penalty for non-compliance, because that is also a big issue on my driveway. Um, this person does have 
I heard that. John Alexander, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's my husband. <laughs> um, it is a, um, he does have a right away at a certain point, so I don't know how else to get his people up there. And I can tell you, 819 people counted by the historic garden we played with her thing, she reported the matter to me, I did not ask. I went away for the day because it makes me nuts. But when I come home and there are car parts in the driveway that have been knocked off of cars, okay, and there are skid marks in the ditches, we have a problem. And it's up to you guys to figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the board for their attention to issues that have been raised recently um, concerning the BZA, and I too have raised some issues. But I do want to first say that I think that the members of the BZA are hardworking and intelligent and dedicated, and I know that all of us in the community really appreciate their attention and focus to the hard work that they've been assigned to do, that they volunteered to do, and um, I have full confidence that given um, effective guidance, they will do exactly what they need to do, and I, I support them entirely. Um, I'm agnostic on the change that is being proposed about whether an SUP should be decided by the board or the BZA. I think either board has potential to, to do a, a, a great job, and if you, the board of supervisors feels like it's better in their promise to do it, I, I would support that as well. I have some technical concerns about the language that's proposed. Um, and I apologize for not getting through here. I've had health camps and been otherwise occupied. But um, I, I do. I, I know that the main way you're proposing to do this is to um, just change in the in the, in the use sections, um, special exceptions to I mean, special use permits, special exceptions. But I think if you limit it to doing that, there are a number of provisions throughout the code where the um, BZA is mentioned as being, you know, for example, in the um, additional use section, 170-62, et cetera, um, they say, uh, the code sections say, the BZA, you have these additional uses as determined by the BZA, um, and you still are leaving within the general section, I think it's 147, um, the statement that the distinction between special use permit and special exceptions is which will decide it. So I'm concerned that if you simply change the provisions by straightening out as you use and switching to SEs, that you're going to leave substantial confusion in the ordinance um, as to exactly what, who's deciding what, and what. Therefore, substantive provisions apply when somebody applies for a permit. So I think that might take a little extra attention. And I, again, as the board wants to make a decision tonight to switch that authority to the, to the Board of Supervisors, I don't know the procedure per se that you would use to, to make that change and maybe then um, you know, turn it over to the staff to, and, and the county attorney to completely change the ordinance to do that. But I, I think what we have right now might be substantial confusion. Is that for your consideration? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bruce Piedmont. Um, I think if the Board of Supervisors takes over this process, that you will get some training also. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I see our visitor is still online. If uh, you are online for the ordinance amendment to Chapter 170, please raise your Zoom hand to be recognized. Okay. At this point, I'll close the public hearing and open up for discussion. Um, start the planning commission. We can. If you'd like, I can have a clarification. This issue's common and it might be beneficial to both boards. Uh, the board of supervisors did want to fast track this change, um, and so the method chosen uh, to do that, as is shown, is very complex to 
change the entire ordinance and eliminate the entire category of SUPs. And as you can uh, imagine, you could have those, an entire continuum of mixture of permits that are SE and SUP. It could be 100% SE, 100% SUP, 50-50, or whatever. Uh, so going to 100% SE certainly works within the ordinance, and then references to SUP are essentially um, uh, of no bearing. But the board could add any category to SUP at some time in the near future if they wanted to. Uh, that said, um, the Board of Supervisors and Planning Commission have just worked through scope um, negotiations with the Berkeley Group to help revise the zoning ordinance. Um, and so that first phase will begin uh, pretty soon with a kickoff, I think, at the end of May. And that will be the process through which broader scale changes will be made um, to avoid that confusion. Or Ms. Ritter. Uh, um, I had I had a couple of I was gonna oh, you ought to come up to the mic. No 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 oh, okay. sorry. <coughs> I'm actually echoing um, a little bit of what Anna K said. I was re rereading the ordinance. It's it isn't simply a matter of changing SC, SU, a special use to SC. There are references to the BZA throughout that um, will be inconsistent if you make the change. And so, if what you're planning to do is, not, is to make that change, I would suggest you look through that whole ordinance for references to BZA before you do that. Then the other thing is, very quickly, the BZA actually does know the law. It may not be the same interpretation that you have, but were it not for different interpretations, there would be no lawyers. So we all know that you know, people make their money off of different interpretations of the law. So I, I, I just want to say that. And I also want to say that, in fact, um, I could find no um, <coughs> problems. The FOIA problems were, the, the one FOIA problem I could find was that it was a sort of sluggish response <coughs> to Mr. Curry's uh, request for all of our emails uh, pertaining to a particular case. So I just want to put that out there too. And then um, if you, if, you know, these hearings take a long time. If, if you want to take those on, I just, <coughs> considering the fact you're about to redo an ordinance and have public hearings on all of that, if you want to make this change, I, I would just postpone it. And not as, as, as poorly as you think the BZA has done, for the most part, we, we follow what the Planning Commission does. Uh, occasionally more uh, restrictions are fewer, but you're not really, you're not in danger land. Uh, and I think the number of public hearings you're going to have on the ordinance are going to be overwhelming. I mean, totally up to you. I, I, I'm also neutral. I think the distinction between special use and special exception is, is really uh, obscure uh, and uh, confusing and is somewhat irrational. So I, I think it's a good idea to put them all together. Uh, <coughs> it's just a matter of the timing and, uh, and how much work you all want to do. If you, if, if you could try to speed the whole thing up by having it go through uh, the county administrator and the zoning administrator. I, I think you're still going to run into problems because neighbors seem to get really upset about these special use permits and somehow that's going to come back uh, in terms of you're going to have to have a hearing at some point. And I guess the planning commission will have that, but it's, it's hard for me to see how it gets streamlined. Also, in terms of, I, I, I think it's a great idea for you guys to know the number of people who are requesting tourist homes and the effect that has 
on the our land use, but you could actually just get those numbers. I think it's now like 40 or something of tourist homes um, from the zoning administrator rather than put yourselves through what could be the agony of more public hearings. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like Peter from us? Yes, please. Thank you, Gary White. I'm the Vice Chair of the Planning Commission. Um, I think it's unfortunate kind of how we got here and how this has become a question of how good a job it is that these are doing or not doing and whether they're trained. You know, to me, our situation is unusual that we divide them up the first time. I haven't really researched this, but I understand that it's, it's odd. Berkeley Group has suggested that we eliminate the difference. Um, I've been on the Planning Commission a long time. Don't ask me what the difference between a special <laughs> use and a special exception is. It makes no sense. So from a pure, pure simplification factor, I think it, it makes a good deal of sense. It's largely a legislative matter. The BZA is largely a judicial body. We are in line to make additional changes to the zoning ordinance, so you may actually have more appeals of the sort that the BZA is actually designed to be uh, addressing. And you know, generally, I think you all are going to be much closer to the will of the voters because these are increasingly uh, policy decisions. You know, how many tourist homes do we want in um, FT Valley? You know, these are these are important questions that define the future in a way that um, you know I think is really the the business of the board of supervisors and. You know, at some point, for reasons that aren't clear to me, this responsibility was partly delegated to the BZA. Um, and certainly, I, I think that was probably the result of some workload balancing in some way. But if you all feel you want to take them on, I, I certainly think it's a good idea without any regard to uh, the great work that the BZA is doing and the great qualifications that they have. So those are my thoughts. Well said. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the planning commission that would like to speak? All right, let's open it up to the board. Uh, Mr. Curry, I was just wondering if, um, as you responded to this issue, if, if you have any additional response in light of Ms. Ritter's comment about potential conflicts, conflicts or <coughs> internal inconsistency. I do not have any concerns. Uh, the, the ordinance right now uh, speaks to the responsibilities of the BCA and the Board of Supervisors as they relate to SUPs and, and SEs. Uh, and to the extent that there aren't inconsistencies today, there won't be inconsistencies tomorrow. Um, uh, so uh, if, if the table is all SEs, then those sections that apply to SEs apply to those, those uses. If the table is all SUPs, then those sections that apply to SUPs apply to those uses. And, and so as it's blended, the sections today apply to a mixture. Uh, so I, I don't see how changing the use table, um, for example, if you just changed one SP to SE, it wouldn't add inconsistency. The fact that you're changing them all doesn't either. Now it does potential add to confusion, and I would encourage the board through the Berkeley Group's work in phase one of that work and to start digging into uh, that confusion part and that this first phase of Berkeley Group's work is focused on process and procedure. Uh, and so if it is, if the board's of a mind to stay with just SEs, I think then would be the time to clean up that process and procedure. I think that's important. So you're saying that if we make this change, people aren't going to get backlogged. There's not going to be applications with no way to put them through. No. Uh, well, and I will say that uh, at the BCA meeting, the last BCA meeting that I attended, uh, Mr. Lockerbie, who's counsel for the BCA, uh, did recall back that there is a, a pertinent court case of what happens when things change and permits are in process. Uh, he was going to go back and do some research on that, and uh, I'm sure Art can do that as well, just to make sure those permits that are in process are handled appropriately, and those are not subject to some challenge later on if the wrong <coughs> body uh, considers them. So we'll be uh, working on that straight away if once we know 
whether there's a change. And just so the, my fellow board members know, when we referred matters at the last Planning Commission meeting, we, we did uh, name both the planning, or BPA and the board supervisors as possible next stops for the application so that we weren't precluding them okay. from appearing in front of the other. So are we, are we in fact still looking for some guidance from um, precedent that would advise us regarding, I think there are two or three SUPs that I'm aware of that are in fact in process. So we need to await well, uh, the buying of this precedent to inform us whether we or the BZO resolve those. Um, yeah, I think that's independent of when the ordinance changes. Uh, there, will, there will likely never be a time when there are no applications in the mill uh, to make a change on the ordinance. So uh, you need, if, if you're of your mind to do to change the ordinance, you need to change it. Then we'll manage the process and the legalities of what goes where when and make sure those I's are done and T's are crossed. Okay. Well, I can say from my perspective that um, this change, for me at least, has nothing to do with the BZA. Before I was elected, I believed that anything legislative done in this county should be done by people who are elected. We do so many permits in this county for tourist homes, and that is changing the dynamic of our county. That should be directly connected to somebody in, to, in a body that's, that's elected, not through, by a body that is judicially appointed by a judge somewhere in Loudoun or otherwise. And for me, uh, when we're giving these permits and taking ag land and turning into this quasi-commercial entity, it changes things a lot in this county. And I really feel as though people need to have a direct connection to that. Um, so that is what has informed me on that. And as we've just heard, we've had some commissioners state that the difference between these SEs and these SUPs, it, 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 there isn't one. And the statute <coughs> says as much. Um, so I would like to keep the politics at least constrained to one body in this county, instead of spreading it around. And I think that the BZA can do a great job, um, and to Mr. Light's point, um, if we have more appeals, those get really tricky. And you know that kind of judicial administration uh, is very different from legislative action. And if a body's doing legislative action, every month, you get used to doing it. And then it's really easy to approach other things, very easy, you know, uh, appeals in that same way. Um, so for our small, tiny county that has so much individual character and is so unique, I just think that this process needs to be here. Now how we go about doing that, I see, is it's not as clean as, um, you know, just, maybe having this discussion tonight because it's really a bigger discussion, but I think that this is the first step in the process. But I really did want to say this, this for me is not anything to do with the BZA's recent decisions. This is something I've thought should happen for, for a long time. So the, 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 that's, that's where I am. That's... And I think, um, <clears throat> just as a corollary to your um, good points there, to the extent that we uh, face a question in probably the near, near future about the role of short-term rentals in our community, I think it is it will be good and it will be informative that the day-to-day -day review of tourist home-related special use permits will be in our purview because that then will in turn inform um, bigger picture um, debate questions and consideration of, of how citizens of Rapid County want this county to evolve vis-a-vis -vis these short-term rentals. And I've talked about it for years that um, there's plenty of evidence from around the country of the profound profound adverse effect that tourist homes, if, if they go unchecked in total number in a particular area, whether it's a neighborhood 
a small town or a rural county, um, that that effect can be really deep and difficult to reverse. So I'm not proposing a cap on tourist homes, but I'm just saying that there are probably there will come a time in the not too distant future where I think we'll all have to wrestle with those big picture questions. And so I think in that sense, um, it's logical that we would be hearing these SUPs, which the vast majority are, in fact, tourist home permit applications. There are very few others. Special use permits that have already been granted, if there's some um, appeal or mm. frustration, how would that be? Well, the, the, uh, there's a processing ordinance for the revocation of um, special use permits and special exceptions. Mr. Groff and I talked about that. And uh, we determined that that would be best determined when we need to determine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we'll cross that bridge. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you haven't ran for office before. <laughs> <laughs> Smarter than that. <laughs> I reckon so. I did look back in my notes, and it was August 17, 2022, I think, with the Berkeley group that we started this conversation. Um, I went back to some of their documentation and it basically said um, to clearly identify applicants' the expectations and to pre prevent arbitrary decision making um, that simplifying and streamlining um, some of our effort at the zoning level and, and others um, would be very helpful uh, to our citizens and to me, when we can't define an SUP or an SE clearly for the people that are using them, those words on a weekly basis, um, it's very difficult, I think, to explain it to the citizens that are applying for one. And um, I know in the Berkeley group recommendation, they said to consider um, changing it back. It sounds like this was done in the way past to help the board of supervisors be able to get through um, and I don't know, Mr. Fraser, how much of that is during your time on the board. I, I think it was done in the 1890s. Just when your Airbnb was found. The first signing ordinance, and I'm so Ms. Lib knows far more about it than I do because she's practiced law here for, for one year. I mean, she was on the BCA for some time, and, and uh, she lived in the Jackson District, too, at one time, so mm -hmm. um, she's very qualified. But I think it was uh, 66 was the first zone movements in Rappahannock County, and they've had a, the SUP permits uh, since the, at least the 73 days. I don't know when it actually came out, but. 1985. Uh, that's the current ordinance. But we had SUPs by the BZA prior to that, so that was up to 1973, but she had worked on that early. The, uh, I think to you're right. Straight to my memory, but yes. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> the old blue one, but uh, yeah. I think we will call it the old blue. But anyway, um, that was a different century. <coughs> so, it, SUPs was supposed to be more of a, of a localized thing, and the special exception would be more of a countywide uh, uh, importance or impact. And, and perhaps that, that worked good back then. I, I don't know if um, it seems to. But maybe the lines are blurred a little bit more now. I, I don't know that either. But, uh, I don't know why it would be any more difficult for one body to do it than, than the other, other than it is a legislative act, and it seems like it's given to be, um, you know, perhaps more political. And if it's going to be political that it needs to be this body of women. And, and I, I do have to be that. So um, um, at the point in time the board would the board member would like to put a motion forward. The ordinance amendment is in your packet. Um, the first page of that document has three green, two green highlighted sections. Um, 
the first one is regarding the April 3, 2023 vote by the board to authorize the county administration to provide that notice. That was five to zero. The second is the vote of the planning commission, which has not yet happened. So uh, before you get too much further down the road, the planning commission uh, should deliberate and make a recommendation regarding the ordinance amendment that's before you, and then that vote tally would be incorporated within the preamble to this ordinance amendment. Thanks a lot for keeping us straight. Thanks, man. That answers my question of whether you need a motion to vote from the planning commission. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Um, is, is there a motion uh, from the planning commission on this matter? I'll, I'll move that we uh, uh, support or uh, advise to pass the amendment as presented. Thank you. Just to recap to catch it for the microphones, that was a motion from Mr. Light to uh, support the um, ordinance changes that are in the agenda this evening. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Scott. We have a motion and a second. Do you need a roll call vote or? Um, procedurally, it doesn't matter okay. to me, but... All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. How many of there? There are seven. seven. They're all here. Yeah. Thank you for being here. So that informs uh, <coughs> lines 31 and 32 to be uh, 7 to 0 uh, for the recommendation. So with that, can I make a motion? Uh, you could, uh, sure. Need to, most certainly. So then I will go ahead and uh, move to adopt the providing zoning ordinance amendment to reassign the permitting process for all uses currently approved by special use permits such that they will be approved by special exception as presented. I'll second your motion. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I'd like to move in this. Thank you for pulling us together so quickly. Uh, yes, and there is a lot of work to be done as was mentioned to yep. yeah. uh, streamline the ordinance so that it's not confusing for people who wonder why does it say SUP if there aren't any SUPs. Yep. All right. Um, roll call vote. Yes, please. Mr. Frazier? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Mr. Whitson? Aye. Mr. Carney? Aye. And I also. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Opening public comment now. Yeah. Speak your name and your district, please. Uh, Alvin Henry, Hampton District. Um, Hold on. We got to make sure to record it for posterity. I'm unmuting you so the one person in Zoom land can hear you. Uh, there's been some talk about uh, the uh, Airbnbs that have been approved over the last number of years. Yeah. And it came up in the Planning Commission a couple months ago about the numbers of, that had been approved and the impact and things like that. So uh, I went and asked the uh, Commissioner of Revenue and, and the Treasurer if they could put together some numbers on the actual active number of uh, Airbnbs in the county. And I was surprised when they came back at 33 units that were actively uh, being used, paying their fees and all like that. So I was expecting something over 100, uh, actually, and I was surprised to hear 33. Um, so I think we somehow know the need to track these, and uh, I've been spending some time in some other counties uh, attending meetings. And uh, Shenandoah County last month, as part of their budget and working on their fees for the various permits and everything, they enacted a uh, a fee on the uh, Airbnbs. Uh, they determined that there was uh, their staff was spending work on tracking these in terms of permits and complaints and, and, and being paid and all these kind of things. So they enacted a permit fee, uh, annual permit fees on the Airbnbs. And the permit fee that they enacted, uh, they did a study and determined that the uh, average fee for one night stay in the Shenandoah County was $235. Mm -hmm. So they made the permit fee $235. And uh, I think with 
coincidentally, uh, y'all talked about the fees here tonight, uh, institute fees on applications. And I think probably we need a, a fee, an annual fee. And if the fee is not paid, then your business app, uh, goes void. So at any t point in time, we will know the exact number of people that we have. And if somebody has a permit and they haven't used it for five or six years, it should probably be void anyway. And this is one way to, to track this every year and to have a handle on, on what's going on. So mm -hmm. that's just a little info. Thanks, Thank Alan. you. Thank well, you, Super useful. Anyone else for public comment? Hmm. Yeah, because if they pay, we don't, even if they pay tax, Okay, going to Zoom. You can't separate Is there any now. chance you would like to speak during public comment? Please raise your Zoom hand. All right, not seeing a Zoom hand. I will go ahead and close uh, public comment. And we'll move into old business, which is draft sign ordinance discussion. Um, before I do that, uh, let me just comment real quickly on uh, what uh, your public commenter had said. <laughs> in the the uh, General Assembly a couple years, two, three years ago, um, enabled localities to create a registry. And I believe that's probably how Shenandoah County is doing that through their registry. And then you uh, can keep track of who's doing what and apply a fee for that registry on an annual basis. Uh, I'd be happy to reach out to the folks over there to see what they did yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, bring some op yeah. options back to the board and whoever. Yeah, because my understanding is that, the, that now the way it works in terms of um, lodging tax remittance it goes to airbnb or homeway.com and then we get a bucket of revenue there's no way to ascribe that right. revenue to individual properties so i think as mr henry described this would be a way to and this is something yeah. that we discussed with uh, miss graham before about how she could then begin to dig in to make sure people are compliant with taxes those intermediaries um, and i think there were some changes this year too that might have helped that area uh, again uh, and that was linked to the requirement, the new requirement to report to the state what your tax rate is for lodging 30 days in advance. And the state's going to have a whole list across the, the state. So these intermediaries can't say, well, how, we didn't know what the tax was in the 95th county. We're supposed to keep track of all these. And so I think there's a give and take with that lobby. Hmm. Uh, that doesn't have a lot to do with signs, which is why we're up oh. next. But uh, it's a good in interesting input while you're both here together. Uh, so um, as the board is aware, the sign ordinance has been under review for a very long time. Um, the Planning Commission um, worked through modifications to a draft that was prepared by staff, uh, largely Art and I. Um, following that, they kicked it back to the board. The board looked at it, and um, uh, it was sent off to the Berkeley Group for their review. Berkeley Group did provide some preliminary input <coughs> earlier on that was incorporated into the draft that ultimately got to where we are today. Uh, just last uh, Thursday, um, I received information from the Berkeley Group, was able to digest that um, in the days following and pass that to both bodies very recently. I don't expect that uh, you will be able to really dig into the meat of what they said. Uh, but what they shared and is attached to board docs is a memorandum and then uh, a track changes document. The track changes document does not include all of their recommended changes. Um, it just had the um, kind of the short list of easy things to, to change to give us a head start. Um, they broke their recommendations down into a few different categories uh, that included recommendations of legal significance, and this is something that Mr. Goff and, and I should review with uh, the zoning administrator um, recommendations of best practices and then um, recommendations for increased clarity or ease of use. So with their upcoming work on the zoning ordinance, they knew that the sign ordinance, which is uh, 
you know, an article of its, of its own and really self-contained wasn't going to receive a lot of focus on their uh, multi-phase approach of the zoning ordinance. And this is their kick at the can uh, for the zoning ordinance, not that it can't be reviewed later. Uh, so they've provided you those three categories of use. Um, I'm guessing that uh, not everybody has fully digested this memo, and I think what would be most beneficial is to discuss the process forward uh, for this document. Um, the zone, the uh, Planning Commission needs to take time and really uh, review it, understand it. Uh, Art and I need to do the same with Michelle, and, and then at the end of the pipe, at some point in time, there will have to be public hearings just like you just had uh, for the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors, whether they're separate or together, that can be determined at some point in time. Um, so uh, with that introduction, I'm happy to try to go through anything with you, but I can tell you that I don't have, um, I haven't digested it myself, so I don't know that how much I'm going to be able to help you or you. Are there any comments from any members of the Planning Commission? I, uh, briefly, I was hoping... Would you mind? I'm so sorry. Would you mind? I found their explanation or their uh, suggestions for temporary signs as confusing as what we already have. And I was hoping that maybe they would give us a, an example of what they meant um, in trying to re, re I mean, maybe you guys can parse through it, but I was, I was having a hard time putting it all together. So, um, and a lot of the recommendations on the legal significance seem to me the most complicated of their suggestions. And I thought, well, you know, if they have an idea, it sure would simplify things. Yeah. If they would just present what they what they have rather than, than say what we making those yeah. yeah okay that's it thank you anyone else <coughs> thank you it's okay Chris Parish uh, Stonewall Hawthorne. So I brought this up before. I kind of gave up on the notion, but I just want to bring it back up as a, a dream for the future, and that is uh, if we could more or less do away with temporary signs altogether, I think it would make the county a lot more scenic. They're, they're distracting, and there's not much control over them. I've been to places where there are no temporary signs, and it's very calming effect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yes, sir. I'll remember that for the future. Um, so, when we started this process with with the uh, planning commission, we, we started with a, a a skeleton that had a lot of meat on it that was supplied by Art and and, and Mr. Curry. Uh, and they, they gave us the framework to build on, and, and we spent a lot of time on it and, and uh, increased the verbiage and, and uh, put thought and, and practice into it. And so now uh, it's gone through the Berkeley Group, which is a, a good asset, and they've come back with multiple pages of recommendation. And I, I would like to see Gary and Art look at this first and interpret the, the legal aspects on it for us and then give it to us and let us take it from that point and not try to mull around with it and then get input from them. I think they give it to us and then we take it from there and try to make some more bread off of it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that sounds reasonable to me. I'll just echo what Al said because, uh, you know, of all, of all the things, you know, having the, the legal chops behind it is the most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so they were, um, we didn't hire them to provide a legal review, and they were clear to say that's not a legal review. Right. But here's some legal things you might want to look at <laughs> mm -hmm. with your lawyer. Take what we get, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I think it's a it's a good idea. Um, Mr. Goff and I can review it. Certainly, by Michelle from the compliance side, she's got to enforce it. 
Yeah. And um, and then you know we might be able to distill some of the subjective language into actual lines that go into the code uh, with some track changes and bring that uh, back to the planning commission to uh, review and um, certainly keep the board up to date with what's happening. If that's okay with the county attorney. Absolutely. Sounds good. Sounds reasonable. Yeah, and I, I just saw after our afternoon meeting, I was at home reviewing emails, and I saw something that came out of Rockingham County um, that was sign-related. I didn't have a chance to dig into it, but I know Al in particular has deep roots over in the Shenandoah Valley, and it would just be interesting to see what's... Sorry. Yeah, but it would be interesting to see what's going on there because... I think, as we've talked about previously, other localities are wrestling with. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I read the same thing it is, and I can't pull it to the front of my mind yeah. at the moment. Yeah, but it seemed to be relatively high profile, and it was about, I think it was about lighted signs, actually. But um, <clears throat> as we get closer to the finish line, be good to do just a, a check around to see what others have done that might inform our sure. final work product. And so uh, at the very beginning of this whole process, um, we had some decisions to make. And um, I think the initial thinking was, well, let's look at the local government attorney's um, model ordinance and go from there. Let's throw ours out and let's just start over. And as you know, we looked at that and Art looked at it, it's like, well, people are really comfortable with what we have. They know what, what it says, where things are. Yeah. And so we switched paths to well, let's use what we have now as a framework and bring that framework in compliance with Supreme Court rulings. And then the changes that, that the community had expressed through the various meetings, and there were several work sessions uh, the public came to and, and discussed really openly with the Planning Commission, which got us to where we are today. Um, that's not to say that there aren't lessons still to be learned from other localities and the forms they use. All right, if there's not any um, further discussion, do we want to just move on to the, leave it with Art and Mr. Curry and move on to the traffic events? Yep. Okay. Traffic events impacting safe access. Uh, so just by way of quick introduction, um, some board recalls, you refer this to the Planning Commission back in June of 2022, uh, generally, and asked the Planning Commission to look into it. Uh, they really struggled with the language for a while, uh, and then the board more recently referred it to the Planning Commission with, uh, by resolution and said, no, we really want you to look at this uh, language and get back to us uh, on how we can move this important matter forward. Um, and that resolution included, um, as allowed by Code of Virginia, a uh, statement that if the Planning Commission is unable to provide their recommendation with 100, within 100 days of their next meeting, then the board can move forward on your own with your own public hearing to amend the ordinance with the language in that resolution. That, that period ends May 26, 2023. Um, my communications with the Planning Commission has been that while the board sent it to the Planning Commission in that way, I think the real interest is for the Planning Commission is to dig into this complex detail and... Um, identify some wording that um, resolves the issues to the greatest extent possible with as few um, parallel or um, unintended consequences as may um, occur. Not that we always know what unintended cons consequences are when we're doing something. Um, so where the Planning Commission is at this point in time uh, is presented on a piece of paper I've placed in front of your spots and is posted to board docs and also uh, handed to uh, the planning commissioners. At their most recent meeting, and I'm speaking for them who are here, uh, I don't think there was consensus on this wording. And then uh, ultimately said, hey, we're going to be, be with the board uh, in another couple of weeks, so let's just all talk about it then. Uh, so you can see what they attempted to do to um, narrow to some extent when this uh, provision applies, and the provision being um, should there be a certain kind of road standard that applies when there are events that draw a certain number of cars. Uh, so that certain number of cars in this document 
is 25 at, at any time, right? Gathering. So if you have an event that you have 25 or more cars gathering, then there should be uh, road access that provides two-way travel on a hard surface road. Um, so the, the Planning Commission worked through that and thought, well, you know, if public safety is there, if fire and rescue is on scene, that obviates this main concern that fire and rescue is not going to be able to get in while people are streaming away from an event because of a crisis. So they thought that was a reasonable carve out. And there was also discussion about, well, do the lanes actually need to be immediately adjacent? Do you have to have a two-way road or can you have an in, in, and out? And I think ultimately thought that it doesn't really matter if the roads are immediately adjacent as long as you, there's a way in and a way out for you know, two different lanes. Uh, but it, it, I think, broke down uh, with the concern for many private events that could trip this sort of provision that happened throughout the community. Um, and there was an interest to maybe separate and I'll have this apply only to public events or events that are open to the public. And that's where um, the usefulness, I think, to the board and the community breaks down because um, when this is put in place for public safety reasons, uh, it is universally applied across the county, then it would apply to all uses whether you are permitting them or not for example, agritourism uses. Uh, and those agritourism sections spe have a specific language to carve out public safety, uh, the, the locality's ability to exert your will for public safety and traffic concerns. Um, if you um, separate this and have it only public and private, that eliminates that broad application and probably would uh, make us not successful in an application to a state allowed by right agritourism type use. Uh, now whether 25 is the right number or there's some other narrowing language like uh, availability of public safety that could get people more comfortable uh, with this. Um, Mr. Light I think has said the, the cure is worse than the, than the, the disease and uh, so you know that's a valid point and so the board needs to think about this and the Planning Commission has really struggled to find a, a, a way forward and do what you've asked them to do without affecting some th events that they're thinking about in, um, in their mind that happen in the community. With that I've spoken far too much and we'll allow the bodies to deliver. And, and any uh, thoughts that the Planning Commissioners would like to, to voice on this are always are welcome. Hi, Carrie Light again. Um, I thank you, Mr. Curry. I think you summarized it very well. I would just add a couple of things. Some of those private events or sort of non-public events, hunts, family reunions, uh, sunrise church services in odd places. Um, you know, we came up with a lot of things just without thinking all that hard about it. Yeah. Um, I would only say, I, I, and again, I, I feel like we were, when we had language that said that it was limited to events that are open to the public, that we had some unanimity. I don't think we got to a point of, maybe we did actually vote that out, I don't recall exactly. Uh, but. I'm, I still wonder, and I would encourage you to look into the fact that you can't make a public safety distinction between the uninformed uh, public ex uh, coming to an event and uh, an event, and something like a family or a private event where you know it's a known risk because you know there's something. I, I, again, I'm no lawyer, and I'm not. I'm not uh, questioning that that if that's if that has been researched and is uh, really the case, but um, I, I I'm not I would I would push on that if I were uh, in your seat. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Light. Thank you. Anyone else?
the issue with uh, we had was struggling with too was the, the issue of public safety because that goes to any type of event there is, whether it's agritourism, it's a, a garden tour, uh, whether it's uh, uh, something else going on, a hunt, uh, fox hunt, uh, steeplechase, all these things. It's public safety goes to all these things, no matter who's putting it on or, or what the sponsor is. So we struggle with that and, and, and how this would impact events that had been going on for decades and it was part of the, the, the heritage of, of the county and how the citizens would react to this. And, but it's important, and I guess the importance of access was demonstrated last week, last week, uh, Friday at the fire that, that, that was had up at uh, Chester Gap when there was access issues there on that road and the house burned down. So, I mean, it, it's important to address is just how do you do it where the people are informed and it's, it's applied equally to everybody. So, you know, that's, that's the struggles that we had. So we're looking for divine guidance from you all. Hi, I'm Steph Ritter. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this, and, and uh, there are multiple private events where there are more than 25 cars, and there's a driveway. Now, I was wondering if you could, I know that this a, it's not a perfect solution, but if people can even gr drive off into the grass to allow for emergency vehicles to go by, that seems to me at least a partial solution. They, the people who drive off might get stuck, but at least the the emergency vehicle would be able to get in. And um, the, in thinking about a lot of the places with single driveways and um, multiple people, the, most of them have you know uh, grass to the sides of the of the drive. And if you don't, I guess that. Uh, you know, then it, it really creates a safety problem. But if there is, I, know, I don't know why you, so what I'm questioning here is the comprised of rock, stone, gravel, concrete, pavement, asphalt. Um, if you could drive off into the field of grass, then that might solve the problem. Well, I can tell you from a construction standpoint, um, when uh, Art and I were working on this, uh, you know, we just included all weather surface, which is, has been a VDOT term in the past. But, you know, I went to look for a VDOT definition. It's really not out there. And so the Planning Commission had a valid point of what does that mean and can you interpret it if you have to enforce this thing? And, and so ultimately that's how the string of rock, stone, gravel, concrete, pavement, or asphalt. And uh, the bottom line is we don't know whether we're in a period of drought or, or it's been raining for, you know, weeks on end and you put two tires off the hard surface and you're going nowhere for a long time and they made things uh, gone from bad to worse. Uh, and so that's why that is in there. Um, I have thought, you know, is there a possible a possibility to make a distinguish, uh, to distinguish between um, a situation where you have multiple parcel ownership parcels and one parcel. And I know a lot of our situations for the hunt and different things like that, you know, you have one parcel owner and, and I'm not sure if that's a distinction that can be drawn or not and still stand up to um, ultimately if anything, any of your ordinances would need to. But if you were to apply this to a situation, um, it has to uh, withstand a court challenge, right? right. And, and if it's, um, arbitrary and capricious because you know you're you're singling me out this couldn't reasonably apply to anybody else uh, you're gonna lose well and I think at the end of the day uh, the Planning Commission we wrestled with this language and we wordsmithed it diligently for a number of meetings trying to reach consensus about how to make a successful product to bring back to the board and uh, we didn't fail because we worked our way through it we just didn't find a way to make that palatable. And I would say for me, one of the decisive factors was Easter services. And some of them were down Kilby Farm Lane, and some of them were up on top of Red Oak Mountain. Mm -hmm. 
and we are going to get into trouble with freedom of religion if we try to make people follow this for church services. And if you can't apply it evenly across the board, you're going to have a problem. And uh, we, we certainly wrestled with it diligently. And um, as I said, I don't think we failed. We just, we just found a different way than we expected. Um, if I remember correctly, when this whole discussion started, it was, it stemmed from agritourism related activities on, uh, roads that were super narrow and really private lanes and, um, short of any legal precedent that might be out there. I was just wondering if there might be some way that we could check around the Commonwealth for, and I, I don't know if, if that kind of information is easily findable, but I just wonder, looking at it through the agritourism lens of other localities, given the state's very broad reach into localities vis-a-vis -vis agritourism provisions and all the thing, all the accessory and customary uses that are allowed under these agritourism provisions of the Code of Virginia. I just wonder if other localities like ours have gone down this path to find a way to kind of maintain public safety in the face of this otherwise state mandated do whatever you want uh, approach to doing business. Um, Cause I, if I'm correct that that's where we started, maybe, maybe kind of reframing this more from an agritourism perspective would yeah I, I certainly forward. can uh send a request through the virginia institute of governments um mr goff could probably shoot something out to the <coughs> local government attorneys listserv and you know see if anybody out there has found a a way to tackle that concern um whether it's tested or not in the courts would be another question. Yeah. And also, uh, we need so many bills went through this year, and there were some that touched in this area. Yeah. Uh, so we'd have to review that in detail as well. One other thing we did discuss on the Planning Commission was that sometimes these carve-outs are made for agritourism, and they're contemplated for counties that don't have the character that Rappahannock County mm. does. We went big on agriculture. So it has a far more impactful return for a county like ours than it does in, a, in an area that has less agricultural zoning. Mm -hmm. And probably more resources to address the concerns that come with the increase of agritourism. So it's really, um, it's really a double-edged sword for us. And um, one of the things that I think that we should contemplate is um, talking to our representation in Richmond and saying, you know, please bear in mind that, you know, this will be very impactful for us because so much of our county is zoned for agriculture. Yeah. And it does open a door to businesses in places we, we never contemplated. And uh, if there's a way to either not take those measures up, or as we've seen in some instances in the past, specifically note that it doesn't or does apply whichever is more favorable to Rappahannock County, um, that may be a way forward too. So it would lessen the impact on our county and, um, and hopefully avoid these kinds of situations entirely. Really good points. One of the things that I thought about, any gathering without public safety personnel on site that attracts 25 or more motor vehicles at any one time, that could inadvertently create a private demand for public safety personnel. Sure, they, they can pay for them. <laughs> it's, it, but it's, it's just, it's, it's an interesting concept yeah. in, a, <laughs> in a county like ours where we, we've got Constrained volunteers. for resources. Well, we've sure. got volunteers. And sure. So it, it's tricky, as you guys have all wrestled with. I mean, that's the first thing that we brought up was Red Oak. That was what I brought up, was like, well, how are they going to do it on Red Oak? That's, they, you can't do, I mean, this, they can't do, they're not going to have safe, public safety personnel up there. So 
Yeah, and I don't know at Red Oak what the situation is at the end of state maintenance, how far additional you have to go on a private and what, what that scenario is. The, you know, Red Oak, the road itself is, is not a private road, right? So much of that is beyond the scope of, of this. Um, it, it is but there is a portion. Yeah, there is yeah. a portion. There definitely is a portion. But I guess the point really is, is about public safety at that, at that point. Uh, and to Ms. Smith's point, uh, we are going to be looking at different flows of traffic from here on out on ag land that just look different. And so being able to deal with that um, is going to be interesting. But my gut says this is um, to, it doesn't encompass what we're trying to do because of the limitations that it puts on so many things that already happen in the county that we all really value and that are part of what the community does. And it's just hard to see that. Like, how, how are we supposed to enforce that? Well, and, and so um, one way to, to have it not apply to so many things is to make 25, 50, 100, 50, yeah, yeah. What, some other number, yeah, yeah, yeah. which only uh, screens out those most egregious situations where um, public safety would be most imperiled if something bad happened. Um, and, 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 you know, this is completely uh, voluntary. You know, there's nobody telling the board that you have to do this. Um, uh, well, no, but, but it is interesting. I mean, imagine that we had th three breweries like mine, and they didn't have these roads. And so you have three breweries asking for public safety all at the same time, and some people can't do it. Some people can pay for it, but then we've got all of a sudden a couple companies tied up just sitting there while people are having events. And then we have a windstorm. Well, or that, or, and or the companies say no. And they can't get their say no. And then at that point, we have now a bunch of businesses that are allowed to be there by right saying to us, hey, this is unfair. Uh, well, maybe, but some I'm just, I'm just blue sky. And so some businesses chose to put a two way road because they knew it was important for their business. No, I don't. Okay, so you don't have to do that. Yeah. You can if you think it's the right thing for your business. And if you think the right thing for your business is being able to have an event, well, then that's going to be much more important for you. I guess I was just sort of thinking about the ag, ag tourism around the state. Um, people love taking this stuff to court. It is highly, oh, yeah. It's highly litigated stuff. So. And that's why yeah. you know, it's, it makes it that much harder to try to draft language that could survive such a thing and uh, you know, has maybe a high likelihood of being tested. Yeah. So to, to do a recap, <clears throat> what, what kind of carve-out can we do if if any, for private functions that are not open to the public and are not commercial in nature. Yeah. Case in point, all my cousins show up. How many was there, 54? <laughs> or 56? It's down to 52. Are they just a Fraser side. Super cars? When the cars? wife and I got married, we had 114 first cousins right. total. So let's just say everybody showed up for a baby shower. They have to, they have to carpool. Carpool. <laughs> they don't make that many big cars anymore. <laughs> Church vans. <laughs> but in all seriousness, though, is there a difference, uh, a difference in threat level to public safety at a private event versus a public event when you're talking about restricted access for emergency response? That's the question. I think the only way you can justify uh, an ordinance like this is through equal application of its provisions, regardless of whether it's public, private, uh, or any other distinction, because the same danger still persists. So it's kind of hard to say. I would I'm agree with you, but I'm just trying to be the devil's advocate here. Yeah, and, and, and that's a good point. I mean, it seems counterintuitive to say, well, you know, hey, it's my private property. I can invite as many people as I want to, you know, the private. Not, I'm not inviting the public, I'm not making any money. Um, but at the same time, if the justification is to apply to agritourist businesses, breweries, wineries, any other business type activity, then to carve out an exception that flies in the face of the very thing you're trying to, that, as they say in the case of the <coughs> people that there was, is being addressed, then uh, you kind of set yourself up for failure down the road because it's kind of hard to justify. Okay, you can have 150 people over at Al Henry's house for, you know, whatever party or anniversary or what have you, 
and it's private, but that if you're going to charge some uh, for the same 150 people at the Frisbee golf course on that agritour tourist you know area, that they can't do that, and then something happens at Al's anniversary party where now you can't get an ambulance up there and somebody's had a heart attack and they die or God forbid the place catches on fire, whatever. It's the same same danger as the evil that you're trying to address is adequate provision of emergency access. So I, I do think that it would fail fundamentally if you were to make a carve out for private versus public events. That's my humble opinion. And this uh, return to the Planning Commission from the board shortly after the our Attorney General um, issued an opinion regarding um, yeah. when some of these, you know, when agritourism privileges apply, and uh, it seemed pretty generous. And uh, when people are enjoying agriculture, uh, then you have these by right uses, which was really opened up the use pretty wide. Mm -hmm. and, um, and which is what, you know, staff's back saying, boy, this could really change the dynamic here in the community like you were just talking about. Uh, we have all this ag property that we set aside. Um, well, it's not so set aside when people can go enjoy it. What, is that, get a cow? I don't know. How do you enjoy it? You spend the night there and pay the money. Right, exactly. <laughs> I think it's the 25 number that is the biggest thing to me because that's not that many cars. Um, I mean, is there a number for you, for you all where it would it gets to a point and to you know? I do agree that church services are hard. You at, know? Like, at the end how of the day, do we do that? I think a lot of the larger events already have emergency personnel on site, like fireworks. I think the John Jackson concert <coughs> did. Point, point. Uh, Christmas in Little Washington certainly did. Uh, ha Halloween, I think, in both uh, the town and the village has emergency folks on hand. I just, I can't think of that many events that don't have emergency responders on hand that draw in that many people. And I, I don't I don't mean to sound glib in terms of what Ms. Mrs. Alexander was talking about. I don't know all the details of your situation. I'd be very curious to know them. Um, but if it's if it is related to something that's been issued, a permit that's been issued, we should certainly review that and and the terms of that permit. <coughs> that's that's a complicated site, um, and the zoning administrator of six or seven years ago um, issued a letter um, speaking to that particular site, which we have to share share with you. And then the other wrinkle is then if, then if you're working with a nonprofit organization, you, you get to enjoy extra privileges. That is true. Um, so a lot, a lot of folks just fly under that. So, I mean, we really need to be careful here. What's your number, Mr. Carney? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 25, though, I mean, like Mr. Frazier was talking about, you can get a lot of cousins together and you've got 32 <laughs> cars. I mean, that's true. 33 is the number. 33. They're feuding cousins, too, some of them. <laughs> the one thing we did on that 25 car thing, we rec that was 25 cars at one time. Right. And yeah. what we tried right. to recognize, like, if you're, you're having an art show or something going on all day long, you may have... 200 cars coming in there, but maybe there's no more than 10 or 12 at one time. Yeah. So we tried to recognize a flow yeah. Yeah, and, and, not, and not capture, not say 200 cars in one day. So we tried to leave some flexibility there with, with, that, with that terminology. And it's the real problem we have is, is properties, we say, with difficult access. That means private roads. I don't think there's any property like yours on a state road, there's a problem. And you look in other counties where you have even bigger uses like yours, like Death Ridge, Culpeper. I mean, they'll have 500 people in there at one time, it's like a little Woodstock going on. And, uh, you know, you have occasional issues there, but I mean, there's no, it's public safety can get in and out of there really well. So it's the properties in the county that, on private roads that are creating our concerns. So, I mean, that's that's the avenue that we really have to look at. It's not the 
the state roads, the secondary roads that are creating a problem for us, I don't think. This is a tricky one. This is a tough one. <clears throat> I mean, I wonder if it, if, if kind of the research idea that I put forward bears any fruit, maybe that'll be helpful because I know all the folks on the planning commission have really wrestled with this and put a lot of effort into coming up with, um, as like, for example, as Mr. Henry described, I mean, 25 cars wasn't an accidental arbitrary number they thought through it. So if we then frame where we are now, maybe with some examples from other localities, maybe that will help us a little bit. And I don't, I don't know if the Berkeley Group consultants have had a chance to look at this. I know this is kind of a, a one-off standalone that was outside the scope of their work, but maybe they point us to what other localities might have done. And maybe we're pioneers in all of this. And if that's the case, then it sure is difficult. Um, and we're out on a limb, so to speak. Um. Mr. Goff was, you know, uh, just uh, suggesting to me that um, some of the issue could be uh, the demand for having an event here, there, uh, down these long private roads that could demand services for fire and rescue if people are trying to get around this ordinance by having a fire truck there or something like that. That could be remedied by perhaps making it a little bit easier to have an event in places that are better for events. Yeah. And so that have state road front yeah. frontage have you know, two lane entrances and things like that. If you provide a, a, an opportunity for those to happen without them being buried down a long private lane, maybe together it's more palatable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help Easter service on top of a mountain. Mm -hmm. but. I was going to say, my experience is people want to do stuff where they want to do it. Know. Yeah. But, you know, good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. I guess, you know, once you start down this path, it opens up all kinds of questions, and perhaps they've been addressed by the Planning Commission already, but what do we do with the, um, you know, event locations that we have permitted in the past, whether the special use or special exceptions? Some of those won't work with this. Yeah, and, and I think this... Um, I think this applies to everybody, and if you've got your permit, then maybe that you've got a problem. I know this came up with Mr. Swindler's uh, barn, and there was question. You raised questions. Hey, we're thinking about this. Um, how do you fit these rules? Should they eventually be in place? It's an excellent question, and I think legally we really have to understand whether we can apply to somebody who's already received a permit from the county. I think we can. Yeah. And you can do anything you want. You just have to be willing to go to court. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was saying before, is that people in the state would love to with litigate this stuff. And <clears throat> there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing out there that, that makes a distinction, distinction public safety-wise about um, secondary roads, tertiary roads, or, or highways. I mean, ABC deals with this stuff all the time in terms of agritourism, wineries, and breweries and stuff, and they get people complaining constantly. And it's up to the neighbors to prove that it's creating a public safety issue for ABC to really listen. And that's almost impossible to prove unless something's <coughs> happened. Right, yeah. yeah. But, and then by then it's too late. Right. Yeah. And, you know, then you, look, you got angry. And that's what we, we've so, talked about this on specific cases where we're trying to um, implore VDOT to do something. And, um, hmm. and, and the, the question is well, has there been any problems? Have there been accidents? Has there been any deaths? Right. Well, we're trying to head that off. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but action doesn't happen without those things. And so this was a way to try to jump ahead of that, if possible. Yeah. It would be nice, though, to get an opinion from the association or um, the chiefs if this is a valid yeah. concern. Good point. Because from what I hear, it's not. It's a public, next public either. safety committee meeting to start there. That's a good idea. Uh, I would like to know if anything's happening in counties surrounding us or farther west, see if they're doing anything. Well, if any county's done anything, it's probably Albemarle. Good point. <laughs> I mean, they're good the point. ones that are the tightest on all this, but not Nelson. 
<laughs> they were like, bring it on. Nelson's like, come on. Madison or Green either. Yeah. Yeah. I checked those. Yeah. When we first started out. And if Madison has nothing that you think it would, because, you know, you're 29 running right now from the middle of it. Yeah. No. Did you have something else, Al? Yeah. You know, we, uh, it's one of the things. We're trying to slip this slippery gene back into the bottle and uh, trying to correct the problems we've encountered now with uh, these ag events on, on, on property on crowded uh, roads. I guess we can only do so much to get it back in there, but one thing we might want to look to is that uh, I think in the coming years that we'll have renewed uh, interest in Rappahannock uh, you know, in, in providing properties out here as things get more uh, developed and, and talk here at Loudon. I was in I got an appraisal assignment a week ago at Loudon, I was telling you a lot that was selling 400000 a building site. And I thought, there's no way I can make this work. And when I pulled the comps, I had 20 comps for the same price. But as those numbers, uh, you know, creep west, I think other people will look at Rapid right Hattie and say, well, you know what, we come out here and get a five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 piece of land, make a, a lot out of it, and get 20 for it. So we ought to think about looking forward in that having a paragraph for something that any approvals that we have for subdivision slip this paragraph in you know, in terms of you know, road standards or in terms of you know, the events that we're talking about. You know, I don't know whether it can be done or not, but it sure would be nice to have a supplemental attachment to that subdivision plan that kind of address public safety and hmm. things like this so that you know, we uh, at least will have to look at the future. So, a little bit of history. You know, I was thinking about what properties, you know, are you know, dangerous to us. And I know Chris Parrish will probably remember Oscar Lingra. He developed a lot of subdivisions in this county back in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and they were 25 acre lots, most of them. And they were all the Long Mountain, uh, uh, from Tiger Valley, Huntersburg, different places in the county. But he created a lot of subdivisions. And they had no covenants. So they kind of lay at risk now to become more of this, whether it's a vineyard or a brewery or whatever. And with the subdivisions have no covenants, you know, it's hard for the neighbors to buy it. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Well, I'm glad we sold all that. Yeah, me too. So, um, uh, the few takeaways that I have is to um, both of us to reach out to peer uh, communities, see if they tackle this in any way. Yeah, it seems like we ought to at this point. Yeah. Um, and also reach out to the Fire and Rescue Association to see or, if they have an opinion on it. Or we can, I mean, whatever makes more sense, we'd start. Be a public safety. Start with the public safety committee yeah. and kind of get a view there. Um, we have, you know, a new member who has significant law enforcement and fire and rescue experience and um, also a constituent of mine, Mr. Nick, who I think will have some good thoughts on this from a public safety perspective. So. And I'd like to thank the planning commissioners for wrestling with this. You guys have done a lot of work. Seriously, thank you. I uh, know you, you, you would come back and report back to us on this constantly. You'd be like, oh, we're tackling it. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's super important that we're wrestling with it. Um, I just know whether we'll ever be able to pin down our opponent <laughs> fully. I guess that's the that's a challenge, but I mean, super thoughtful consideration from the plan commission at least tells us that it, it, it ain't easy. And we gotta really think through unintended consequences, I think, in the end. People putting on the events like the Garden Club, um, I don't know how we can recommend to them that they speak to the neighbors that are gonna be impacted as much as the person that's got the folks coming through the house. Um, 
and be nice neighbors about it. I don't know how you talk to nonprofits and folks that are trying to do these special events that people love, um, but impacting the neighbors and tearing up yards and doesn't sound very neighborly. Yeah, and so, to some extent, uh, some of these uses might be allowed by right today or allowed administratively, and perhaps those are things that should be looked at as we go forward. They shouldn't be administrative. Uh, maybe some of the other ones should be administrative. And then if there are impacts on neighboring parcels, those are almost always the most critical aspects of special exceptions, special use permits, and uh, putting conditions in place so that those impacts are marginalized to the point that they're consistent with other typical buy right uses. And so if you can't put a condition on it that does that, it should be approved. Uh, and so I mean, that's the general idea of, yeah. of special exceptions. So um, and maybe an analysis mm -hmm. of, of that needs to be done to identify in situations where there are shared, pro shared drives, more restrictive requirements must be applied. I didn't start a uh, time clock or anything, but anybody got any idea how long we spent talking about this subject tonight? No. I'm just serious. Any any idea? 20 minutes, 30 minutes? 8.46. Yeah. 8.46. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I haven't heard how we're going to enforce it once. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I there are a lot of zoning ordinances that are difficult to enforce. Um, you know, all of them are are intended to um, create an environment where people want to comply. Um, doesn't always happen that way. Uh, but because it's, a, it's not a running count of vehicles, it's a static count, uh, that's where uh, a single photograph of, of a location with in excess of X cars is pretty good proof that there's a violation. And then there's a violation at a certain date Specific, and time specific. And so I think that enforcement side for this particular thing is, is rather easy. Now, maybe it needs to show whether there was a fire truck. You know, somebody could say, well, the public safety was there. You just didn't see them. And we're totally relying on the neighbors. Uh, well, I mean, if it's a late well, night on a weekend, then yeah, they might be the ones that's, that are taking the dated photograph. But. I, I do agree with it's interesting. However, to Mr. Henry's point, there are so many pieces of property in Rappahannock that you're going to have to get to and has three, four, five, six other houses on it. And by right, currently, you can do a lot. And as the pressure just, you know, comes down, we're talking distilleries, breweries, wineries, and now you can spend the night. And what's a farm? I mean, if, even if you're not a brewery, the, the recent AG's opinion was like, well, how many acres does it need to be? I, I, genuinely, I don't even know. It just has to be ag land. We've got a lot of two-acre parcels, five-acre parcels in this county that are ag. No, I, I definitely think it's worth, worth thinking through. And, and you guys, that's literally what we've been doing and you guys have been doing. So I think it's a really healthy, good discussion. Cause it, and it's tough. So... So I think we've got our marching orders. I think the Planning Commission and the community probably understands that the board's unlikely to adopt an ordinance amendment um, pretty soon on this. So um, you've got, you've all informed each other. Yep. 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 At least not tonight. Uh, and uh, with many thanks to the Planning Commission, Thank do you. I have a motion to adjourn? Yes, Thank you, Mr. Light. And a second? Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Sis. Thank you, everyone. All in favor? Yeah. I think they're all in favor. And I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. Yeah, exactly. You have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Thanks Thank for you. coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're one for